Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to episode two of the Aki Hood podcast. So I'm joined today by my co-host Abdullah and a very special guest today who is a graduate from uh, Sharia Kasim University um, and also a teacher at Medina College um, in London. Assalamu alaikum. Ustaz Khala Hassan. Assalamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, so today, just to ease things in, inshallah, instead, as you know, we're going to start with some quick fire questions. Inshallah. I've only got four of them written down, so yeah. inshallah, will be fairly easy. Um, but the first question is, Apple or Samsung? Oh, Apple, one hundred percent. Apple straight away. Yeah, yeah. You, you've never been on Samsung. I've been on Samsung for years, and I suffered, and it made my life absolutely horrible. So never. Okay, never. so you're the opposite, right? You you were Apple first, and moved to Samsung. Yeah. A very short time, I used Apple, but no, not for me. It's not for Samsung. you. Samsung okay. or Android, even better. No, no, that's a weird one. I've always been on Apple as well, so I'm yeah. with you. The second quick fire question, I know the answer, but mm. for the viewers, what is your favourite football team? But I'm going to add, why? Um, Arsenal traditionally, obviously, because when I was younger, they were the team that was winning everything. Okay, mm. first. And then the third question is, what is your favourite country that you visited? Apart from obviously being in Saudi Arabia, I'm studying there and going to the, you know, Mecca and Medina. Uh, t- as of now, Turkey. Turkey? Okay, that's yeah. interesting. Istanbul, why, why Turkey? Amazing. Just it was just the Islamic history that's there and going to the me- huge Masajid, the Hagia Sophia and all those things. Amazing, amazing place. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a Muslim country which isn't, it's a Muslim country where there's, you don't have camels walking, not camels, you don't have donkeys and, yeah. and, and you don't see, see you know, it's, it's, it's a secular country. But I'm trying to say it's a Muslim majority country mm-hmm. that... When you go there, you don't have to worry about being harassed. The police treat you kindly. People treat you kindly. There's a level of hadara. People are um, there. Um, there's a level of civility. You might not find in other countries. No screaming and shouting and bump and you know cars beeping and all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 there's, there's a level of civility which I personally like. I can't do the whole kind of cars beeping, you know, speeding and just madness that we associate with. Muslim country so alhamdulillah that's what I like yeah, about okay. about Turkey I think that answers the next question as well okay. which is what country if you were able to visit besides okay, obviously Those Mecca, countries, yeah, yeah. Uh, Saudi mm. Arabia what country would you visit or what city would you love to visit or maybe one you haven't been to yet I think I'd like to visit the States I would never yeah. tell that to students like, <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd like to visit the States to be honest with you no 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 um, you're going to put me down a you're going to put me down a rabbit hole. I, so <laughs> just for a place to go and see for no kind of, because um, there's countries I want to visit for like the historical, you know, it's the past. I'd love to go to Andalus, Spain. Of course. And look at the old Muslim forts and try to find out where the libraries were and this and that. I'd love to do that. Mm-hmm. I'd love to go to North Africa to see like, you know, the places where Maliki fiqh, fiqh was. I'd like to go to places in West Africa, Sudan, here and there. Um, even the Asian subcontinent. Mm-hmm. Because of just of my attachment to just like knowledge. But if you're just talking about pure, unadulterated kind of just going somewhere to have a, you know, not a good time. I don't want people to think it's in a different <laughs> yeah. way. But going to a place where d- that just looks scenic and nice. I will say the States, poss- most probably because... Yeah, I'll say the States. I'll say the States, yeah. States. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. The reason why is because it's such a large country, they've got like huge international cities. Obviously here, you know, we're mostly from London. Yeah. So like if we go to like Birmingham or something <laughs> or Manchester or here or there, you know, I'm not going to say it's not a level down, but it's a much smaller city. It's not as international. You, you know, America, you've got like LA, you've got Chicago, you've got New York, you've got here, you got there. So just to see this place where immigrants all came, built the country, um, and how, you know, the economy over, you know, in, in its history just boomed and things like that, just to kind of study, you know, how did it get to, how did it become so developed so fast and things like that? I don't know, I'm, I'm a, I like that kind of, I like reading about development and things like yeah, that. No, so it that's, interests that's me, you know, so it's only been, you know, I think 1877 was when, you know, it became what it was. How did it get from that to there in like 250 years, mm-hmm. you know, and looking at the infrastructure and I always like to look at different countries' infrastructure, how were their roads? Are there cracks in the roads? Are there potholes? You know, and things like that, and the architecture, and just things like that. It interests me. So I'd like to go there. You know, I went to Canada. Alhamdulillah, I was nice. But I went in the winter, so it was um, I wasn't able to experience it Canada. the way I wanted to. Yeah, yes. but Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. No, that's, that's, I think that's really interesting. Mm. Um, and the last question is, mm. and I said there was only going to be four, but I've added to the list no because problem. this is like the make or break for me. Okay. So. 
because I'm a massive foodie. Okay, and, and yeah, I think same here. Abdullah, you are as yeah. Yeah. We, we <laughs> went to we went to when we went to um, cheat meals. <laughs> yes. I bought some from cheat meals that time. I so remember, yeah, I remember yeah, we went. Yeah, yes. so yeah. And, but mm. what is your favorite cuisine? Now the comments are gonna go crazy if you don't pick their cuisine. <sighs> Just, just, just a joke. Okay, I'm not gonna say where the country is from, but the brother was a lovely Muslim brother. Okay, from a typical Muslim background in the UK. And the brother went to Italy as a student, not to Medina College, and he was in the middle of Italy. And you know, you would think that you know, being in Italy, he would want to you know have some Itali- an Italian slice yeah. of pizza or some lasagna or some sort of pasta. He went to a, he went to go have some shawarma. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Okay, I said, come on, man. I said, you're in Italy. I said, okay, man. I want some shawarma. Um, but no, um, what, what, you know, I, I like a lot of food. Mm-hmm. If you were to stick me on an, on an island, I, I wouldn't say a dish, but I'd have to say a potato because I can fry it, I can boil it, I can bake it. Anything that has potatoes in it, I like. Um, I like rice. I love rice. I love different types of dishes. But I can't pick one, one. Okay. type of food. So I would just go with an element. If you just had no, to stick me with a fruit or veg or something, it would have it's to be a, that starchy potato. That's a very intellectual answer. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm just saying. <laughs> because, you know, if I'm, you know, I'll, I'll mash it for a few days and yeah, after, you know, okay, I'm tired of that. Fry it, have some chips or whatever, and you know, kill an animal or something. And no, just, you can have you know, it with anything. <laughs> potato, chips, and fries. Some people have it in like a curry or something. Exactly. Do you know what I mean? So you can add it to the rice. It's a base of everything, exactly. So I think that, but in terms of dishes, I love, you know, I mean, I, I like food, you know, so alhamdulillah, you know, I, I don't think I could. No, I, I might use that as my answer for now. <laughs> but, but I um, I do enjoy food that I could go without is probably like Chinese takeaways. I think I could, yeah. I could do with that. Okay, fine, yeah. fine. That's fair. <laughs> I have one more question mm. and I'm just adding to the quick fire. I'm sorry. Okay. If there was three people mm. you could... Obviously, you wouldn't pick us. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, uh, if there's three people you could ha- uh, have a conversation with from past or present or even now. Yeah. Who would the three people be? I think that would have to, exc- I mean, the prophets, everyone wants to meet though. So, of course. you know, I think historically speaking, I think I would want to speak to Umar bin Khattab. That would be a conversation. Because of some of the actions that he did, which I found to be amazing. So, from a Sharia perspective, um, there were some Qabail, there were some, for example, um, tribes of the Rim Peninsula that used to take the jizya. They had to pay the jizya. So, the Muslims, obviously, for those who don't know, um, in a Muslim country, or in a, when, 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 you know, in a Muslim country, basically, um, there's a tax on all Muslims once a year called the zakat. It's, it's, it's you know they call it an arms tax on what you on what you on what you um, on what you earn. Apart from livestock, you know zakatul ibl, zakatul baqar, zakatul zakatul ghanam. Um, apart from zakat on livestock, camels, sheep, and cows, most people give zakat in agriculture, gold, which now relates to money in today's world. So. We generally give 2.5% of our wealth. Now, for people, that's for Muslims. For people that are non-Muslim, they have to give something even smaller, like a smaller percentage, it's just called the jizya. The funny thing is, is when he went to one tribe, I forgot the tribe, I'm not sure if it was Najran. I'm not sure if it was Najran, it could have been, but he went to some, he went to a tribe and there were Christian tribes. So he just asked, you know, it's the yearly tax to pay the zakat. And obviously Allah says, you know, al jizya ta'an yadin wa hum But, they said, we're not going to give you jizya. jizya. We're going to give it to you, but don't call it jizya to us. Don't call it jizya. We don't want to be, we're not people who pay the jizya. We'll pay it to you, but don't call it jizya. And Umar said, khalas, alaykum. So that flexibility yeah. in applying yani, rulings I found to be amazing. And I want to ask him, just, you know, the Battle of Qadisiya that, you know, and, you know, um, going to Egypt and, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, opening Egypt and and opening um, um, Asham, you know, the, the Palestine and those areas, and you know, the ulama of fiqh say أنهم يعني أنه جعلها وقف للمسلمين. Those those countries التي فتحت عنوة. Those those countries that were that were conquered by Umar, um, in in particular Egypt and 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 you know the Levant area. You know, Asham, whereas what's the modern day Palestine, Syria, things like that. He made it a waqfun ala al He made it an endowment, meaning that um, 
the, it's for all Muslims to share in its benefit. It's for all Muslims to share in its benefit. Um, and that raises a lot of questions. That raises questions about the nation state, the concept of the nation state, the concept of borders and things like that. That raises a lot of questions. If Umar radiallahu anhu did this, that means that Muslims would be able to freely move in those areas and, and things like that. So there's, there's a lot of things I would ask him. So it's Umar, number one. I think a second, the second person I would want to speak to um, is anyone from Andalus, any scholar in particular who witnessed the fall of Andalus, the fall of Spain. For those who don't know, Spain was under Muslim, was a Muslim country, a Muslim majority country. The Spanish people themselves had become Muslim. It wasn't an Arab occupation of Spain. The Spanish people themselves became Muslim. And obviously, just like all of us, we have, you know, Khalid, your name is Adam and Abdullah. Okay, I remember your name. Sorry, just saying. Yeah, okay, so, the motion. No okay, diabetic okay. coma. I'm joking. I'm not diabetes. I'm just saying it. But, but uh, uh, Abdullah, you know, don't, don't have any of that stuff. But um, they assumed the Muslim names. Obviously, none of us here generally. Obviously, my, my, you know, maybe historically we have some sort of Arab blood because Muslims are just mixed with everyone. But generally speaking, we're people who became Muslim maybe centuries ago, a thousand years ago. So we assumed Muslim names, right? So. Um, that's what happened in Spain. So I would love to speak to a Muslim scholar who witnessed the fall of Muslim Spain. Now, people always ask me because, you know, I sometimes go on, on social media. So when I talk about Spain, why do you love Spain? Is it because it's some sort of European country and things like that? And you want to go and, you know, marry a Spanish woman and, you know, grill fish on the beach? No, no, no this is not that. The thing about Spain is that Spain was a Muslim country that was filled with scholars. And that's what I find that's what I struggle to get my head around. How do so many scholars, some of the best scholars that were ever produced in Islamic history, mm -hmm. the land that they live on now, the graves that they dwell on now, had they, they, they would be turning in their graves if they knew what Spain is today. How did that happen? That's a, that's a question I want to ask. Yeah. You know, your Ibn Hazms, your, uh, um, who's, who's a great scholar of, of Spain, you have um, Ibn Abdul Barr al Andalusi, a great scholar who wrote uh, two explanations on the Muwatta of Imam Malik. Okay. You have al al uh, Shismo, Abu, Abu Walid al Baji, the great scholar who was from Portugal, Al Beja. It's a town still in Portugal. Okay. He's from Al Beja. Um, 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 uh, Ibn Abdul Barr al Andalusi was the, was the, was the Qadi, he was the judge of, of Lisbon. Okay, for some time. You have Imam Al Qurtubi, you know, Imam Al Qurtubi from Cordoba, Spain, who wrote the great tafsir and his one, you know, and the teachers that he took from, you know, Qadi ibn, ibn Al Arabi, Al Qadi Abu Bakr ibn Al Arabi, the great Mufassir of the Quran as well, right? Who took from, uh, uh, whose scholar was Al Ghazali, and he spoke about Al Ghazali and said, Al Ghazali ibtala al falasafa. فحاول أن يتقيع فلم يستطع الغزالي swallow the arguments of the philosophers try to vomit them out but is unable to يعني so it's a whole issue in Islamic yeah. uh, in studies about philosophy and things like that and then you have other scholars you know Ibn Juzay Al Maliki you have for example so many scholars right and the riots that would happen in in Spain as well even between the Muslims you know the Berber rebellions for example where the North Africans felt as if they were marginalized by the Arab uh, uh, armies at the time because now people from North Africa for example assume the Arab identity but at the time they still spoke the Berber language and they were learning Arabic but like the Arabs were fresh from the Arabian Peninsula so it's growing pains of people coming together almost like in London where you have people who are like anti-immigrant pro-immigrant this and that you have that in all kinds of communities so I'd love to see what happened with Muslim Spain you know when the poet one of the great poems I think it's Lisan um, um, is it Lisan al-Din al-Khatib I forgot his name anyway you know he has a, he, he writes poetry about the fall of Andalus and he says حَيْثُ الْمَسَاجِدِ قَدْ صَارَتْ كَنَائِسَ مَا فِيهِنَّ إِلَّا نَوَاقِيسَ وَصُلْبَانُ he said that we witnessed the mosques and it's just, he's just witnessing it's a historical statement we're not anti any other religion in terms of we want everyone to become Muslim, right? Yeah. But he said that when we witnessed the mosques become churches and we and we um and there was no adhans being called. In fact we heard ringing of churches. Our mosques were turned into churches, you know, and um Ferdinand and Isabella, who were the rulers of Spain or you know, whatever of Aragon, whatever they're called, they promised the Muslims that you will have you will live side by side amongst us and that we will not, you know, take away your language, take away your culture. And yet, you know, within a few decades, you know, 
the Muslims are being forcedly converted to another religion. Mm -hmm. They're being massacred. And that's why in Spanish butcher shops, you see a, a piece of pork on the wall. And that's Spanish culture because when the Muslims were kicked out of Spain and they lost power mm -hmm. and the Granada, Grenada finally fell, they you had to put pork on your um on your what do you call it on your uh, on your butcher on the butcher uh, on the um, on, in your shop mm -hmm. to show that you are with us and things like that you know and that and and then they burnt all the Muslim books all the scholarly books on Islamic law and Hadith were burnt and the only thing that was kept was the was the books of medicine that the Muslims had because at the time the Muslims were the leaders of medicine going back to the great scholar Ibn Rushd scholar of Maliki Fiqh he wrote the book Bidayatul Mujtahid wa Nihayatul Muqtasid which is what students in Medina study in the faculty of Sharia and he was also a what do you call it? he was also a scholar of of medicine and he's the one who translated all of the works from even though you know as Muslims we don't philosophy is not a part of our religion as a, just through his scholarly uh, contribution he translated all of the works of Plato and Aristotle into Arabic and then the Europeans took that back because they had lost that. They lived in what you call at that time the Dark Ages. It was the Dark Ages, right? So, so that fantastic history to the point where you, you can Google his name. He's known in in Western yeah. in Western uh, academia. He's known as Averroes, okay. And then you have other you know scholars like Ibn Al Faradi who wrote a a biography, you know, of the. Um, of all the scholars of, you know, he calls Tariq Ulama Al Andalus, history of the scholars of Andalus, right? Um, and he goes through the he goes through all the different personalities and what cities they were from. Some ulama from Malaga, Malaga, you know. Now it's a party town, but then it was a place of scholars. You have ulama who come from a place known as Wadi Al Hijara, you know, the um, the um, the Valley of Stones, for example. You have some ulama who come from Madrid, which is Madrid today. You have ulama that come from Saragusta, Zaragoza, and you just can't. I can't believe that this was a Muslim city. These were, Muslim, these were Muslim places. And Christians and Jews lived side by side. Okay? Um, and that's why one of the great poets, you know, he said, مَلَكْنَا وَكَانَ الْعَفْوَ مِنَّا شَجِيَّةً وَلَمَّا مَلَأُ فَلَمَّا مَلَكْتُمْ سَارَ بِالدَّمِّ أَبْطَحُ He said that when we ruled the land, عَفْوُ Turning the other cheek, mercy was the ethos of the land. But when you came to rule, it was bloodshed. وَحَلَلْتُمْ قَتْلُ الْأَصَارَ وَطَالَمَا غَدَوْنَا عَنِ الْأَصَارَ نَعْفُ وَنَصْفَحُ And you made halal the killing of prisoners. But when we had prisoners, we would always turn the other cheek and, and leave, and what do you call it, and turn the other cheek and, and you know, let them, you know, just, just keep them in decent conditions. فَحَسْبُنَا الْوَزِئِ فَحَسْمُ فَحَسْبُنَا التَّفَاوُتَ الَّذِي هُوَ بَيْنَنَا فَكُلُّ إِنَاءٍ بِالَّذِي فِيهِ يَنْضَحُ So sufficient is a difference between us and you for every bucket will eventually for every bucket will one day spill of its entrails whatever he said it's not talking about Spain it's just Arabian poetry yeah, talking yeah, and him yeah. that poet himself got murdered for the things that he said but anyway so, Muslim, yeah exactly it's called <laughs> Mutanabbi it's a great it's a great thing anyway so I would ask a scholar of Spain I'd want to meet a scholar who witnessed the fall of Spain mm -hmm. so that's Umar radiallahu anhu a scholar of Andalus and the third one I'll make it from today's time it can't be us it can't be you guys uh, I, I, <laughs> I would want to meet a scholar known as Hamad al-Ansari al-alim al-mashhur al-muhaddith al-muhaddith of al-Madina his name was Hamad al-Ansari Hamad al-Ansari was born in the 1920s he moved to al-Madina in 1944 he was born and raised in mali in a this is a this is a crazy story and i'm sorry for you know going down this rabbit hole you have to forgive me okay we've been in lockdown for a few years and when you're just re when you're just reading all the time <laughs> you have to let it out i'm a human being hamad al-ansari was a great scholar of of hadith an arabic language they call it ulum al he was a scholar of the um he was a scholar of all sciences he practiced, he loved Arabic language, poetry, and the study of hadith. And he knew other sciences. Now, he was born in Mali. He wasn't um, ethnically, um, or for example, the native, uh, what do you call it, like uh, African population. He was from another, but they, everyone was somewhat mixed. But he was from the Arabs who descended from Spain. So he was from the people that 
uh, during what was called the Reconquistilla, or whatever it's called, the Reconquistilla, which was the reconquest of Spain. When the Muslims were driven out of Spain, they went into North Africa, and some of them went into a beled known as Bilad al Tikrur, which was the Malian Empire. They come to the Malian Empire, and they were there for about, he says, 400 years. His family were in Mali for about 400 years, right? So he, but he was originally from southern Spain, going back 400 years. The family kept the history and stuff like that. The French take over Mali, which is known as French Sudan, and his family and his tribe of people were scholars who would teach and live in the desert, like how the scholars of Mauritania are somewhat. The French wanted to put them in French school, so they were one day surrounded. You can find this information in his biography known as Al Majmour, written by his son Abdul Awwal or Abdul Ahad Al Ansari, I'm not sure which one. Um, I think it's Abdul Awwal. They surround the village and they say, You must enter. French school and for those of you who don't know about the differences between um, um, French colonialism and British colonialism British colonialism was very much we collect we collect taxes at the end of the year Salam alaikum do what you want chop each other's heads off do whatever you want, which is better than French colonialism French colonialism because of the um, because of the um, French revolution this is what I'm trying to say. When it comes, the, we need to know these issues. The Afwan, just on a side note, we need to know the dunya that we're living in. You can't just live in this world not knowing what's going on. Okay? Because then you're existing, you're not living. Makes and you're just like a leaf. You have to know what's going on. So the French Revolution was a revolution that had large ramifications in Europe, in the Western world, America, X, Y, Z. Anyway, the French Revolution happened before colonialism. So when colonialism starts, the French Empire want to export the French Revolution to different parts of the world. So they force people and try to amalgamate them to what was going on in France in terms of secularism and things like that. So they tried to push that on these mesquine people in this little village where Hamad and Saadi lives, known as Ta Da Makkah. Ta Alif Da Alif, Ta'da Mecca. We'll get back to that little village, inshallah. I'll keep that. Remind me if I forget. Just mm -hmm. remind me of the village, Ta'da Mecca. They say, go and teach in the school. You have to teach in the school, otherwise, we're going to, whatever, you know. Hamad al Ansari says, I'm not doing this. He, he says, I'm just going to go to Mecca. That's all he says. He's, he's 18 years old. It's 1943, and he says, you know what? Enough is enough. I'm going to go and live in Mecca. Him and his cousin. Buy some, <laughs> buy some camels. They travel to Niger and then travel to Nigeria. Meet the scholars of northern Nigeria, where I come from. They stay there. The scholars are there. He teaches there. He stays there for about three months. And then he goes to Chad. He's arrested in Chad. Okay. And then he moves through Sudan. Stays in Sudan for a few months. And then goes to Mecca. Then goes to uh, uh, Mecca. Then Al Medina meets, you know, ulama like Ibn Baz and stuff. They realize how much knowledge he has. And then he ends up becoming a teacher. And he ends up going back to Al Medina and, you know, being a professor in the University of Al Medina. And he went through so many adventures. It's so fun, his book and the different people that he met. Now, when he was traveling, he would always say that whenever we've met British troops, they'd let us through. Whenever we met French, you know, colonial troops, you know, that always gives us a bit of a hard time. That's what he said. So I want to meet Sheikh Hamad Al Ansari. Just talk about, you know, his life and things like that. You know, my cousin was actually his driver. Oh. In, in Medina, yeah, because one of my, you know, my cousin's husband, sorry, my cousin's husband was a driver from Al Medina, a brother called Sheikh called Ahmed. So I'm sure Hamad al Ansari knew this. I thought as if I, I made a discovery. <laughs> um, Sheikh Hamad al Ansari is from a little village known as Tada Mecca, right? You guys, inshallah, Google this man known as Al Bakri. He's an Andalusian traveler, like Ibn Battuta. You guys heard of Ibn Battuta? The great, he's a Moroccan traveler, went to China, went to here, went to there, and wrote about his journeys. A person, there's another kind of person who used to travel the world. He was called Al Bakri. Al Bakri. Al Bakri has a book. He tra he travelled, and his book is known as Kitab al Masalik wal Mamalik, the book of highways and kings. And he talks about how to travel to Morocco from Spain. When you're in Spain, go to this area of this town and travel from this door. And he's talking about the Spain of his time. Mm -hmm. Al Bakri is a well known explorer to the point where NASA gave him, named him, they gave him a crate on the moon, one of the moon's crates. This is named, you know, the Al Bakri crate. <laughs> anyway, Al Bakri writes towards the end of the book, Al Kitab al Masalik al Mamalik. And he wrote this book in the year. 
400 after the Hijrah. He wrote this about 1,000 years ago. So he talks about how to get to Mali, okay, how to get from Andalus to Mali. He says, you know, go down here, go to Morocco, go here, go there. And he says at the end of the journey, and you'll eventually end up in a village known as Tada Mecca. And I read the book for myself to verify it. And he does say that. So he spoke about this little village called Tada Mecca a thousand years before Sheikh Hamad al Ansari was born and left. And I wanted to know, does Sheikh Hamad al Ansari know that he came from this? You know, this, this this village that you know is a tiny little village, and the real Tada in the one of the Malian languages means here. Here is Mecca. It's a it's a little village in a valley, and that's why it's called Tada Mecca in the language. But to think that that village has been around for a thousand years, yes. just I find that to be mind boggling. So those are th three people I'd like to meet. And it's still there today. You mm -hmm. can still visit. Subhanallah. Mm -hmm. Subhanallah. Umar bin Khattab, a scholar who witnessed the fall of Andalus and Al Hamad al Ansari. Okay, I want to. I want to go back to Omar bin Khattab. Mm. Where you mentioned zakat, and that obviously comes under jizya, yeah, yeah jizya, jizya, yeah. and mm -hmm. it, com it comes under your finances. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess that brings us on to the first question of this topic go ahead, of yeah. finance. Mm. And it's as a Muslim, how important is finance, and what does the Quran and Sunnah and even the Hadith teach us yeah. about it, um, and teach us about financial independence and stability? Lovely. When it comes to finance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran Allah has made buying and selling trade halal and riba usury haram interest or certain types of interest because not all interest falls into riba but most of it does so Islamically Islamically buying and selling is permissible and in reality it's a must why? Because people have to live in this dunya. Allah says, well, I ten sir, ten sir, in dunya. Don't forget the share in this world that you have to live in. So you have to live in this world. You have to operate in this world. You have to live in this world. What shocked me, what really made me realize the importance of finance and money as a Muslim is studying knowledge. When it came to studying knowledge, most of the time people give, or give heartwarming lectures and things like that. Even when it comes to students of knowledge, Many of the previous generations who went to study Islamic ilm, you know, decades before us, they came back and they'll tell us, you know, a lot about, you know, the sunnah, the sunnah, the sunnah. And it was shi'arat, it was, sh it, was it was, it was, it was just statements, but there was nothing tangible we felt as if they came back with. Not all of them, I'm just trying to say, it was, that's what why came across. When I went to study fiqh abroad, we studied books of fiqh, Hanbali fiqh, to be, in to, be, to be precise, but all different, all the madhahib have the same chapters. You go through what you call ibadat, the chapter to do with worship, tahara, purification, salah, how to pray, uh, hajj, zakat, uh, zakat X, Y, Z, uh, all different types of prayers and things like that. No problem. And then you go through another major part of the book, which is Islamic contract law. And not only is it contract law, it's contract law on certain types of Islamic forms of trade. So, for example, you have things known as a salam, which is to pay for something now and to receive it later. You have something known as a rahan, for you to take a loan, but then to give like a security. So, for example, I lend £500 from you and I say, you know what, I've lent £500 from you, but this pillow costs £250. Take this as a security, if I'm unable to pay you the money, you get to own this and I pay you 250 back, mm -hmm. for example. And you can sell the value of this, for example, right? Yeah. You ended up finding, I ended up, you know, so you end up, you know, the, the ahkam, the ruling of riba and what riba is. I was just gobsmacked and even uh, studying zakat and realizing, <laughs> you can only pay this if you have money. Yeah. Can't pay if you don't have money. If someone has nothing, can't give you anything. So it was these it was these things which which I found to be it was a shock to the system because um, you know, where I grew up in my neck of the woods, uh, a practicing Muslim was a person that went to the masjid every single day, which is obviously of course an amazing thing, but there was no concept of wealth creation, wealth distribution and things like that. So studying, I found it no interesting at all. But then as I got older and realized I'm going to have to one day have a family and X, Y, Z, I need to know these things. Mm -hmm. So in Islam, 
what is the position on trade? The position on trade is that it's halal, it's permissible. And there's a qa'idah, there's a rule when it comes to trade or when it comes to all actions outside of ibadah, worship. And it's al-aslu fil mu'amalat al-hil wal-ibaha. The asl, the rule of thumb, the default law when it comes to all things outside of ibadat, i.e. contract laws and things like that, is that they are permissible and that they are allowed to be done. Opposite to or in contrary, contrary to worship. In worship, all things are considered forbidden until proven other, otherwise. Meaning that you can't invent your own prayer. You have to pray that like the Prophet Muhammad said, you know, when Allah says, Warka'u ma'arraki'een, do, do record with the Western people doing, uh, Farka'u ma'arraki'een, Warka'u ma'arraki'een, um, do record with all the other people, for example, all the other people doing record, you have to do record like all the other Muslims, okay? The Prophet said, Sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli, pray the way you see me pray. For example, um, so uh, or the hadith of Umar, for example, when we do takbir for the salah, we can't do takbir with the back of our hands. You know, we have to do it like that. We can't do that. Allahu Akbar. Because yeah. Ibn Umar said, "Can Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam إذا قام إلى الصلاة رفع يديه حتى يكون حذو من كبي." You know, Prophet Muhammad said that when he would do takbir, he would lift his hands until they reach, reach his shoulders. And other hadith said it until he reaches his ears. So you can't go now and say Allahu Akbar. That's not takbir. Takbir, which is which is mujzi. Which is which one must do is in accordance to the Prophet. Sallallahu the opposite is in trade. So trade is halal. Now, how did the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions used to trade? This is something that again I had to really understand. Here in the West or in Western countries, we use a fiat money system. We use paper money. Okay. Now the thing about paper money is that paper money once had an intrinsic value In the sense where a paper, if you got a £50 note It was basically a guarantee that you have £50 worth of gold once upon a time But because it was very difficult for people to actually exchange gold and carry gold Bankers would hold your cash and give you like a piece of paper and say that when you need it, you can come and get it. And that's how paper money, you know, started in Italy. They call it the Flemish, in, in, in the, the Flemish bankers or whatever they were called. Okay. In the, now, prior to that, people used to barter. This is another concept I didn't understand. Bartering. Because, and I'm going to get to it. When it, gets, when it comes to the issue of riba, I couldn't understand certain masail of riba. And in particular for those who study the ilm and also who are studying, they'll know this concept of riba al-fadl. I'm going to break it down, inshallah. I know what riba nasi'a was, which is you lend me money, I lend you money and then you pay me back more. We all know that's a riba. But we, there's another type of usury, riba, riba al-fadl, that when you exchange two items, particular items, they need to be equal in value. But I didn't understand that. How can you exchange two of the same items? But we're going to get to that. That's because um, I didn't understand. I was using the um, I was using the metric that I knew to identify what this was, and I had to bring myself out of the box. So to have, in, the, in the time of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, people would trade for gold in gold, silver, grains, barley, cows, different materials. That's what they would use. Okay. Now the currency was dinar and dirham, generally speaking. Uh, dinar, gold, dirham, silver, right? But people also used to barter and buy gold. They would buy gold with gold. Makes it doesn't make sense. Yeah, it doesn't. People would buy gold with gold. People would buy silver in, turn, in return for silver. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us people would barter in time for Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So several different things could have a currency. So I could trade, I could trade, I could sell my house for 100 cows. And the trade would be permissible. It didn't have to be with cash. Mm -hmm. What cash does now is um, cash is the only currency we generally speaking use to buy products. In the past, in time of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu that wasn't the case. That has benefits for those who who like crypto because it shows you that the authority, the the state, the authority. Doesn't have full control of the money supply If I can use cows as a currency Then I'm not using the money that has been given to me by central banks I'm using wealth that I intrinsically own And it's outside of the 
kind of central banking system. If I buy a house for a for, for, for a few cows or something, I know it sounds ridiculous, but I'm trying to say that that's how it is now. Now it, it doesn't do that. It, it, we use obviously the, the money, the money kind of the monetary system, which in of itself is a flawed system and has its issues and and things like that. But yeah, generally speaking, time of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu they would trade, and trading was something which was not frowned upon. Allah said, "فَإِذَا قُدِيَتِ الصَّلَاةُ فَانْتَشِرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَبْتَغُوا مِنْ فَضْلِ اللَّهِ." The prayer has been done. The Jum'ah prayer has been done. Now hold on. Ya ayyuhal ladina amnu, idha nudiya li salati min yawm al Jum'ah, fasgu ila dhikri Allah wa dharu al bay'. Thalikum khayrun lakum in kuntum ta'lamun. O you who believe, when the Jum'ah is established, fasgu ila dhikri Allah. Go to the to the to run to be speedy to the remembrance of Allah. Wadharu al bay'. Leave behind trade for now. Thalikum khayrun lakum in kuntum ta'lamun. If that's better for you, if you know. When the law says, if the prayer has now been done, then go back to traveling across the earth and seek the abundance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Muslims used to trade. Trading is something that a Muslim should do. A Muslim should not want to beg and be a shahad, a person that's a beggar and things like that. So Muslims should beg. But now there's a particular, um, dimen- there's a few rules that we need to stick to. And the ulama, they give some conditions. The ulama, generally speaking, when it comes to buying and selling, they have some conditions on the thing that needs to be sold. So all things can be sold except for a few things. The ulama, some ulama have put it into a few lines of poetry. Al-ilmu wa taradi wal ahliya, ibahatun wa qudratun jaliya, wal-ilmu bil athmani wal mabi'i, fahadihi shara'it al The first thing you need to know is you need to know what you are buying. You need to know what you're buying. At-taradi, you need to be pleased with what you're buying. You can't be buying something that you're forced to buy. If you're forced to buy it, it's a problem. You're not buying it. And in nafs, you're not buying it because you want to buy it. Which is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the ayah of bay'ah. يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تأكلوا بأموالكم بينكم بالباطل إلا أن تكون تجارة عن تراض منكم. Oh, you who believe, do not consume one another's wealth in, in, in falsehood. Don't steal. Don't usurp. Don't take other people's wealth, except for when you're trading and both are doing it willingly. So you need to know what you're buying. You can't be buying something which is unknown. You can't say I'm going to buy this and not know what you're buying. You know what you're buying. You need to. Uh, be pleased with what you're buying, meaning that you're not forced to buy. No, no one has got a gun to it. Hey, yo, buy me this right now. It needs to be mubah. It needs to be stuff which is permissible. So things which are not permissible to consume or to use in the Sharia are not considered wealth. Alcohol mm-hmm. is not considered wealth in the Sharia. I know that obviously in different parts of the world, for example, here, you know, like a huge packet of, um, like a huge bottle of like wine that's like 200 years old is like maybe hundreds of thousands of pounds you know the older the wine the more valuable it is mm-hmm. and it, that has no value islamically because it's not considered something which is halal to consume okay um and that's what the ulama have like a, they have a rule they you know they have a qaida and fasad. when something is prohibited against doing it or trying to do trying to exchange or trying to use that particular thing and do that particular thing it's considered fast in the sharia it's considered something which is not which is nullified so you can't even engage in it إِبَاحَةٌ وَقُدْرَةٌ جَلِيَّةٌ وَالْعِلْمُ بِالْأَثْمَانِ وَالْمَبِيعِ You need to know the you need to know the price and what you're getting and that's basically the basic things. Also, you can't buy something which is totally unknown, like I said to you before. You need to look up when it says al-ilm. You need to know what you're getting. So I need to know, I need to know the basics of. Let's say I wanted to buy a laptop. I need to know the basics of the laptop. What you need to know to buy a laptop. I'm not saying who made it. What? No, I'm trying to say I need to know. What the base the basic things that all people need to know how the gigabytes has it got any wear and tear and things like that mm-hmm. just those basic things not go ahead go ahead. Uh, how about when it comes to like um, job lots what sorry job lots where you can What's, buy okay. where you can buy things in bulk mm-hmm. you have a slight idea where for example excellent like Amazon return we're gonna get to that that's a good one just and that leads into this thing when we say you can't buy things which are unknown. You can't buy something unknown because you need to have knowledge of what you're buying. But what do I mean by that? There's a pregnant cow. And I'm sorry that we're talking about old old things because, I mean, we all live in cities now. No one buys cows. But the scholars wrote this book and, yeah, what can we do before the Industrial Revolution? What can we do? Okay, Let's say you have a cow, you want to buy a cow. 
you can't say I want to buy the baby in the cow in the cow's stomach. Why? Because you can't identify what it is yet. It could be born born deformed and it could come out dead. It needs to come out alive for us to see. Okay, so we can give it a price. We can't price. What can you do though? You can buy the cow, and then after you get to have what's inside it. And that's what the ulama say. Yathbatu taban ma la yathbatu istiqlalan. You can buy something which comes with something that otherwise, if you bought it separately, you wouldn't be able to have. Now. We said that you need to know what you're buying, right? There's nothing you can't do. You can't do al-gharar. You can't sell some... Okay, hold on. That pregnant thing, that pregnant uh, uh, fetus, okay? If we were supposed... If, let's suppose I bought a pregnant... I bought a sheep in the stomach of its mother. So I didn't buy the mother, I bought the sheep. That that would be deemed impermissible. And in this, in a perfect Islamic society, I would get my money back. It wouldn't be able to go through, right? That's known as bay' al-gharar. That's known as gharar. Gharar means jahala, something which is unknown. And there's a hadith in though it's you know it's a bit weak, but the meaning is you know correct. And the Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam and bay al gharar. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Bay to buying of of gharar." And he probably said in his report, I've said in the hadith, "La tabi' ma laysa indak." Don't buy that which you don't know. So the question goes: How do you sell watermelons? We don't know what's inside it. It's a pomegranates. You know what's inside a pomegranate? Those things are ma'fu and those things the Sharia is lifted on it. A bit of gharar is is. So, all things have, to a certain extent, a level of gharar in it, mm-hmm. a level of uh, unknown. And so, so there's always going to be some, something that's unbeknownst to you to a certain extent. Mm-hmm. If you, like you said, you're selling something, you're selling huge orders of, you know, you're buying, you know, things in huge volumes. You know, you're a car dealer and you buy, you know, 5,000 vehicles. You can't look at every single vehicle and know. You just know that you're getting this, you know, I'm getting 1,023 plate golfs. They've told me that it's good. The guy's trustworthy. Okay, maybe one or two might be faulty. Mm-hmm. But that you, you can't go in and spend 5,000 cars. Maybe some, you know, you've got some brothers, oh, okay, you can. We have to be realistic in the Sharia. So a little bit where you can't s- escape is permissible. But you can't just say, I'm going to sell you this. So you've got your hand behind your back. You can't do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Makes sense. So those things are permissible. Um, and like I said, you can't involve yourself in riba and things like that. So apologies for going on a tangent, but okay. nah, I'm if you've got any. Well, like, when mm. you're going back to when you mm. were saying where within the Muslim communities there mm. wasn't understanding of generation of wealth, mm. where do you draw the line between like striving for more wealth and being happy or content with, with the risk Allah's provided? Have Excellent. you in that? I think that look, there's a hadith or there's a saying of Umar radiallahu anhu, two sayings. One of them, I'm sure it's from him. One, I'm definitely sure it's it's attributed to him anyway. The first one is, he said, Kad al-faqru an yakuna kufra. Poverty, destitution is almost kufr, is almost disbelief. Because when a person is in a state of absolute poverty, he will do anything. Think about a person who is on drugs, on, on co- not cocaine, crack or fentanyl. Once he withdraws from it and he's, he's, um, his withdrawals have ended and he wants to take the drug again when he's craving, when his cravings come back, he has no money. What do they do? They go to the streets and they'll offer themselves to do anything just for £10. I say, I'll do anything to you, for example, right? Now, he's not impoverished, but he's, he's so desperate. It's the desperation of the poverty will make you even fall into disbelief. So that's one thing he said. And the Prophet said, even a hadith, like, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-faqri. Oh Allah, I seek refuge from you from poverty. Poverty is destitute. Now, there's a difference between living in abject poverty and being poor and getting by. We're not talking about that. And we're going to get to your thing. But poverty is a problem that Muslims should try to stay away from. We're talking about destitution, where you can't even have any control of your life. You have no, um, you have no say with how your life is going. You feel totally helpless. That's when people do crazy things and shoot schools and things like that. When they yeah. when they give up and just feel helpless, right? So that's a, that's one thing. You know, I read it in a in you know I, you know one one you know one of the scholars attributed it to him anyway. It was in a saying. It was a saying about Arabic language. But he said, "La tulithu bidari ma'jiza." Do not dwell in a place where you are unable to make any kind of money whatsoever, because you're not. There's going to be no benefit. Even Mecca was a place of business. Even though it's a wadi ghayri zi zar'in, it's a value that has no, um, that had no, you know, fertile vegetation like Al-Madini. It was a place where people made money. 
So now going back to what you call it The dunya needs to be in your hand and not in your heart And that comes back to your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a raziq Is the one who provides And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he gives and he takes And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجَ وَيَرُزُقُهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِ Whoever believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make a way out for him and he will give him sustenance from where he doesn't know. So there were some people from Yemen in the time of, of Umar radiallahu anhu, and they were in the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam masjid or in the around the Medina anyway. And he saw them one day, and he just walked past them. He saw them again. You know, they were just sitting on the floor, you know, remembering Allah, just you know, acting holier than thou kind of thing. He kept seeing them for a few days. He said, "What are you guys doing here?" They said, "Nahnu mutawakkilun." We are the people of tawakkul in Allah for our sustenance. He said, Antum tawakkul. He said, You are the tawakkul. You are the, this is tawakkul. He said, Bel antum tiki'un. No, instead you are the people who are just leaning on the, on the what do you call it? Tiki, you're just leaning on the, on the, on the walls of the masjid. Or other, his reports, he said, oh, No, antum tawakkilun. Saying, basically, you're not, you don't have tawakkul. He said, The person who has tawakkul is the person who goes and Tries to get their daily living Gets a seed Puts a seed into the earth Tries his best to cultivate it And then leaves the rest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala So you still have to do the groundwork The problem is The issue becomes where People get lost in the groundwork Where their whole their, their whole life becomes wealth And this love of wealth Allah said Al-hakamu takathur That you are You're preoccupied with Constant Takathur, always getting more, always trying to, uh, you know, usurp and take more wealth, always trying to gain more wealth, and that's Bani Adam. Bani Adam, the sons of Adam, they they want wealth. So the question is, you have to balance and remember, and uh, what do you call it, and remember that this comes from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and He's the one who gave it to you, and He's the one who takes to can take it away from you, and based on that, you know, separate yourself from that wealth. In halal means, give some away to sadaqah Give some away, you know, and and manage your wealth. Of course, manage it, manage it for a rainy day, manage it for savings, manage it for starting a business. Of course, that's 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 what sensible people do. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in the Quran, "Wala tu'atu sufaha amwalikum." Don't give people who are sufaha, who are unintelligent, who are idiotic, who are people who are not smart, not wise, are not don't don't think thing don't think things through. Do not give them your money. Don't give them your money. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in the Quran. You understand? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that even the yateem, the the um the um the orphan, when he comes of age, test him with his wealth. Give him a bit of his wealth. If you see that he's good with his wealth, if you see the orphan is good with his money when he comes to a certain age, give him the rest of his money because now he knows how to use the money. But if you see that he's unwise and he doesn't know how to use the money, you can't give it to him yet What does that show? That shows that people need to even be told And taught how to use money So it shows us that these things are very, very, very important So that as a Muslim What would you say are the most important aspects Of Islamic finance that we should all know? I think that People just need to know what to stay away from in the Sharia um, Principally, obviously Those things are haram, riba and things like that But I'll say that more things are halal Than they are haram so what I would probably say is for Muslims who are embarking on business and generally speaking, I think most Muslims of our generation, British born practicing Muslim brothers who are practicing, I think most of them are doing a good job. So I would say to them, just try your best to not allow this wealth to get into your heart and regulate it properly. But more th- and don't in- and don't use your wealth and don't gain wealth through har- haram means and don't oppress people through wealth either. And these are the kind of um, guidelines that the ulama speak about when it comes to wealth and wealth management. Based on the ruling that the scholars have given, that all things are halal until proven otherwise, there's not much to say apart from sell things which are halal, which is most things apart from alcohol, things to do with zina, pork, um, all these other things, you know, these things which are haram, riba. You can't do those things. You can't sell things that you don't have um, in totality. You can't, for example, you know, gamble, make money for gambling and things like that. Those are the things you can't do. Apart from those things, the majal, the, the, 
the the thing is, you know, it's, it's you're you're free to kind of what do, what do you call it? you can't engage in riba also. In that case, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. when a person is looking for a job, mm-hmm. how deep does he need to look where the money is coming from? For example, oh, companies. oh, this is another big thing that we need to answer. As a Muslim, let's say for example, you get a job at I was gonna say IBM. That's old days. Apple now. Yeah. I'm gonna go to Silicon Valley, Palo Alto. Mashallah, living it up, you know. To stay away from the beggars in the, what do you call it in the, in the Skid Row. But you're going to California. You got your good job at your tech startup. What is upon you as a Muslim? Do you now have to look at how the company has got their money and X Y Z? No, you don't. I'll tell you why. Now. If your job is a haram job, selling mortgages to other people, then that's a haram job. You can't do that. But as you as a Muslim, your contract is between you and your employer. This when it comes to contract law. Your contract is between you and your employer, right? So as long as the contract is you are a data engineer, you do 35 hours a week for us, you fix up our internal computer systems and that's all you do and for that you get your four you know you get your five thousand you know american dollars a month or you know let's be honest your silicon valley you're gonna be at least ten thousand a month something mm. that contract between you and what you have to look at is a contract between you and your employer that contract is permissible there's no riba there's no usury there's no zulm there's no anything haram any kind of oppression there's no selling of alcohol. There's no uh, selling of other haram products. It's simply you doing a task for an assorted amount of hours and receiving your money at the end of the month. The contract is between you and the company and they're paying you for that. And that is simply permissible. Why is that permissible? We know that's permissible because the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to live in al Medina, and there were Jews in al Medina. And still uh, uh, other kinds of uh, tawa'if You know you had some non-Muslim Arabs and things like that And the Prophet ﷺ used to do and, and the companions used to do trade with the Jews And they never asked the Jews and the other people of Medina Where did you get your money from? And we all know that in the Quran And we all know that for example The, deals, the Jews used to deal with riba, usury mm-hmm. But they never said is your money halal? No, they worked for them and they got their money. They, what, they, what they're doing with their part of money between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not, it's not between you. Your transaction and him is halal. It's because where does it stop? If that, if that, if that qa'idah was not there, then you wouldn't be able to sell something to somebody until you know how they got their money. Mm-hmm. That's not the case. If you're selling thobes or you're selling phones, if a person comes in with their money, it's assumed that their money is halal. It's not assumed that their money is haram. You don't ask a person, did you did, did, did you sell alcohol? Did you sell pornographic material? Did you sell um, gambling tickets or whatever it is, raffle tickets for gambling? You're not going to ask a person that. You're going to assume that the money is halal and you take it. And that's how it is in the sharia also. We know that the people in the time of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa were engaging in illegal things in terms from a shari perspective. But... The companions didn't ask, they just dealt with the money. What was as long as it wasn't haram between themselves, mm-hmm. it's not a problem. That's really interesting. Mm. So I know a lot of brothers who that, that's actually changed my outlook on a lot of mm. things. I know a lot of brothers who would they they, they get offers from companies, uh, tech companies, and they have to turn it down because that they know that company engages in, mm-hmm. for example, uh, selling alcohol, for example. But although their contract has nothing to do with the mm-hmm. alcohol, it's just the tech side of exactly. things. That's, that was that they, yeah. they could technically work for that company to the point where some ulama, even of the opinion, I've heard scholars say, for example, that even in even in companies that deal with haram, for example, like even like a bank, mm-hmm. if you're working for the bank on the cyber security side of things, it wouldn't be haram because you're not dealing with that thing. But that's some people who say that obviously it would be always it would always be better to stay away from it. Yeah. But they're just trying to show you to what extent does that ruling kind of go to. So you don't have to look at um, how your company has what do you call it has raised its funds as long as it's not engaging in a haram industry it's got nothing to do with uh with thing in the time where like living in this country is becoming harder and harder not only for your iman but also just financially a lot of families muslim families look to getting two incomes for the household especially with sisters mashallah getting 
much more educated, going into the workplaces now, getting into different careers. How does that work in an Islamic family? Where, like where we said before, we said that the ruling is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made buying and selling and trade and you know you could technically put you know work income on that as halal. So the question isn't how do we working is halal for man and woman. The question is so that's not the issue. The question is the agreement between the two parties in the household. It's yeah. between the two parties. If the husband and the wife agree to both work. There's nothing wrong with that on the on the on the basis that both of the work is halal. She's not in a place which is going to compromise her religion or being in a place where she's humiliated or things like that. You know, so most brothers, you know, maybe school teacher, nursery teacher, nurse or something, whatever, like things like that. You know, then we're not telling her to go and work in a gambling shop. So that's technically permissible. Yeah. The question is, is that what ramifications is that going to have on your marriage? That's the second question. That's what you need to ask yourself. Mm -hmm. Will there be, will there be a diff, will there be different ramifications on the marriage? And that's what you have to ask yourself, because there is going to be a change in the equilibrium. There's going to be a change in the dynamic of the marriage. Of if we've got now, we've got two people working. Um, there might be more money, and some couples. I'm guessing Muslim couples will just get along fine. It's fine. Some Muslims there might be a bit more difficulty. You know, when it comes to the division of labor in the house. So that's something that you need to hatch. You guys, both as a couple, as a Muslim couple, now need to ask yourself: Is that something that you want to do? Personally, personally, my what I generally incline to is um, the man. Obviously, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, from an Islamic perspective, the man nisa that the man is supposed to work. The man is supposed to be the provider for the household. Okay, Okay. we don't have both money Okay, so we don't have enough money Okay, so what we do now is If there's not enough money We need to think about it We need to strategize We need to strategize and, th and, and this is the thing that, that a lot of people don't, You have to strategize in the dunya Okay, what's the strategy? Your wife is a smart woman She has the ability to work You can speak Okay, look, look at my career where, where am I going in my career? How much am I earning right now? What You say to your wife, you know What should I do? To maximize my income So that it's like I'm bringing in a second income I'm a 40k How do I get to 70k You have to think like that You don't just work mm. It's another thing You see you brothers You know mashallah University educated Yes alhamdulillah But what about the brothers Who are Amazon drivers You know they're on stagnant wages They You can't be on 30,000 pounds for, for 30 years How am I going to get to 70,000 pounds In I don't know Four years Five years And then after you work Okay you know what, if we can figure out a plan of how, how to I get to £70,000 in increments, she might not need to work. Mm -hmm. That's maybe a better idea to do. You have to look at it as working together. Mm -hmm. How do I make that money? And then things like that. But like I said to you, if she wants to work, and I don't think most brothers want that, but if she wants to work, um, if she wants to work and, and the husband's agreed with it, then khalas. But they have to understand that there's always going to be ramifications. You know, there's always going to be ramifications and sometimes not, not for the best. But what I'll say is, you live in a country now where you have the ability to upskill, upskill, be, be be that what it may. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I have so many more questions. Yeah, I want to ask inshallah, you. we'll leave it here. Inshallah, so many, don't worry. But um, unfortunately, that's all we have time for. Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. a reminder for everyone watching today: please do check out uh, Osaq Al Hassan on all socials, mm -hmm. um, and also don't forget to like, subscribe, and stay tuned for more. Inshallah, Jazakallah Khair. Mm -hmm.